copies of lectures have seen him more often than you have seen me. But I would like to say a few words about what a great boon to our campus it has been to have Dr. Aigner with us this year. He uh, has brought together, as you know, five colleges, five uh, foreign language departments or sections, and many foreign languages within those departments and sections, which is no small feat in itself. But he has brought a, a great freshness of approach, I think, to foreign language teaching here, which has been a great advantage to our students and our faculty, and I think to everyone else in the city who has had the opportunity to meet him and hear him. And that in itself is a very important uh, fact for which we are very grateful. Uh, the topic of his lecture tonight, I think, characterizes his approach to all these things. It's a direct and active <laughs> approach to foreign language teaching. I'm very happy to present Dr. Wilfred Aidner. Thank you very much, Mr. Friedis, and thank you very much uh, who have come again to be bored by me for about an hour about uh, teaching and the way we do it back home. And uh, I'm trying tonight to uh, speak about our as it has been already stated about our direct and active approach. And I'll just have to repeat a little bit of what I said last time to uh, give the background. I want to emphasize once more, as I did last time, that the direct method is a method that did not grow out of any new theory that had been developed anywhere at the university. It is a method that is entirely pragmatical and empirical that is to say, it's a method that was developed by teachers for teaching and not uh, by uh, any uh, scientific approach to language itself. This may appear to be a disadvantage. Uh, at the time when the method was developed, it was most certainly felt to be a, a great advantage for teaching. And I must also apologize for one uh, thing uh, that uh, I'm very sorry about. When I prepared uh, back home in Germany to come here, I wondered what kind of books I should be bringing along for demonstration purposes, and I felt that uh, the method itself has been best developed in English, but I was very sure that uh, English as a foreign language would not be so very interesting here, so that I didn't bring any books of that kind. Uh, we use the direct method the way I feel about it also in the teaching of French, and that is why I decided to, take quite, uh, to bring quite a few books of French teaching and I brought some German material. Some of you have already looked at the books uh, as I have put them on display in the back of the room, and uh, you are certainly welcome to do so again after this talk. Uh, some of my material then will be taken from French books and will be in French language, mm -hmm. because as I said, I did not anticipate to uh, have groups of teachers from various languages together in one event like this, uh, which is very flattering for me indeed. Uh, just a few days before I left, one book came out uh, which uh, was a very good example of what I think uh, the direct method should be as far as the textbook is concerned. And so I just decided I'd take this book, and this is one book of English, Learning English, uh, the second volume of a three-volume course. And uh, I'm fortunate uh, that I did bring it because I am able at least to give you some examples that will uh, be uh, comprehensible to all of you because I'm sure that uh, none of the foreign languages here is uh, known to all present tonight. So I have taken some examples from the English book, and I will have to supplement these, exam these examples afterwards by uh, exer excerpts from the French books, the books for the teaching of French. Before I uh, go into the details of the method, I should like to uh, state once more what the idea of the direct method is. I stated it from the historical point of view last time. I want to do it with this uh, little sketch here. <laughs> but I'm a bit not low, I'm fortunate this time. Yes. Uh, by MLS, I do not mean to pretend any new club, modern language society or anything like that. Uh, and I mean to represent here the modern language, the mother language speaker who uh, learns his mother tongue, his mother language, which I am simply representing by a second circle. And it is through his mother language that he sees what we call in German Wirklichkeit and what is called in English reality. You remember I uh, mentioned some of that last time. 
I did not uh, make uh, these lines uh, all very much alike, especially I left a little gap there just to indicate that uh, none of us even speaks his mother language perfectly. Uh, when we speak the mother language, uh, we want to communicate and we uh, do so uh, through the language. Uh, speaker A uses the language and speaker B understands it. Uh, the mother language, the ta mother tongue, has become a code of communication and I think this is something that we must keep in mind that whereas language is something that always develops and that is always uh, has a wide margin of variety on uh, both sides of correction, uh, it is uh, a code which must be as clear as possible so that it can be clearly understood by any other speaker of the same language. This situation is quite simple and it's the general uh, communication situation. The situation changes, of course, when we encounter a foreign language speaker because uh, not only is his language foreign to us, uh, we do not understand it at the beginning, but also his language represents a different approach to reality. And this word that I used last time is actually an example already for this different uh, understanding of the world as it is seen through the different medium. This was not realized in former times, especially not in the um, 19th century, it was believed that uh, it was simply necessary to equate mother language and foreign language, that is to say, to have a little bit of an idea about the grammar rules and then just to translate by using these rules. It was not realized at that time especially that actually uh, you cannot equate the two things because they are different, because the two languages represent different views of the world. So this has been felt to be a mistake by teachers and it was of course later proved to be a mistake by structuralists and other research. It has been found that the picture is something like this. The two languages have each uh, its own structure and uh, some things that are found in one language may not be found in the other language. Uh, they have not, they, these things have nothing that exactly corresponds in the foreign language and the whole set of the whole world picture as I said before is different. So when uh, the approach to the learning of foreign language is by translation what happens is that not only the view is distorted but also uh, there is quite a, a great possibility for misunderstanding and uh, misinterpretation of meanings from one language into the other. This situation gives rise to the necessity of the direct method. That is to say, we must try to avoid this detour via our mother language to the foreign language. That is to say, when, for example, we study a new unit in our textbooks, and I want to go to get to practical problems right away, when we study a new unit in a textbook, we should not, first of all, think of the content of the unit in our mother language because this is going to fix the content of the unit within the structure of our mother language and it will be very difficult, it will be that much more difficult for us to understand a similar context, a similar situation in the foreign language. So we should try to avoid this detour and should go directly from the mother language to the foreign language. And this is exactly what the direct method tries to do. That is to say, it uh, tries to approach the foreign language without the detour of the mother language. It has been tried at the beginning, and you remember, if you were here last time, that I spoke about the exaggerations of the early reformers of the direct method in the last two decades of the 19th century. It uh, was tried at that time to pretend that the mother language didn't exist at all and to use the foreign language only. At that time, the structure, uh, of the different structure of uh, different languages had not yet been uh, discovered or realized. And I think even today there are some methodologists who believe that the foreign language can be learned independently of the mother language. Uh, it, uh, the, sentence, the phrase there is of a coordinate system. I do not think that this is possible. The mother language is always going to interfere because we just cannot think without uh, using our thinking habits and those of course were established by the mother language but we can try to get as closely as possible to an immediate understanding and thinking 
in the foreign language. And I think this word thinking is quite important. Not only should we try to get to the meaning uh, by some way or other, but uh, we should try to avoid even using in our thoughts our mother language words, uh, let alone, of course, in our books. And I personally uh, feel that uh, some of the uh, books that I've seen in various classes that I've had the privilege to visit would not, uh, could not be used with a direct method for the very reason that very often they give the translation of the text that is given as a unit, uh, as a text for study. And uh, as soon as you give the translation, of course, the student will revert to the translation that makes it much easier uh, for him to understand what they are talking about in the book. And he feels that is what is interesting for him. And uh, uh, the immediate approach to the foreign language will have been barred to him. Uh, the teacher, in, under the direct method, will try to use the foreign language in his instruction. That is to say, he will try to avoid the mother language as much as he can, but we are no longer uh, exaggerating as the early reformers did. We believe that certain things will have to be used in the mother language, for example, grammar explanation. And the, here I have used the word grammar, uh, and I will just have to remind you that I'm not speaking of grammar as it was used in the 19th century, but of grammar as it used in the direct method, and I will have to show you tonight how it is used. I propose that uh, rather than speaking very much about theory anymore, I go ahead and show how a teacher goes about teaching a unit in a foreign language, and I will take it from this book. As a matter of fact, this is, this is the latest stuff. No German uh, pupil has ever has seen this lesson, has studied this lesson because it is from the second year part of this book. This book is to be used in two years, and since it came out last year only, uh, this has not been used yet. Uh, first of all, of course, the teacher will try and get acquainted with the text as it stands in the book. And I have just uh, picked one lesson at random, not quite at random, to be uh, honest. <laughs> I hope you can uh, read it. I'll uh, at least read a uh, part of it, the first part. It's page 74 in this new book. It's about the Boston Tea Party. It was, in th it was the year 1773. Three ships with a cargo of China tea were crossing the ocean. They were bound for Massachusetts, one of the English colonies in North America, and they hoped to land the tea at Boston Harbor. Everybody, everybody on board was uneasy. The British Parliament in London had passed a law that the American colonists were to pay a tax on every pound of tea taken into the country. They also knew that the colonists had said, we won't pay a penny tax on tea. There might be trouble when we arrive at Boston, said the captain of one of the ships to his friend, the first officer. The colonists are getting too independent. Well, I can't blame them. Why should they be taxed by a British parliament 3,000 miles away, asked the first officer. Don't forget that they are British subjects after all, replied the captain. I know, but not one single colonist is allowed to sit in the British Parliament. There is no one to represent them, and they ought to have been represented long ago. That's nonsense. If they want our help, they ought to pay for it. Ten years ago, we had to protect them against the French, and we still have to protect them against the Red Indians. How can England protect her colonies if the colonists are not willing to pay for that protection? and so on. This is part one of this new unit number 14. The teacher uh, studies the text at home first, and uh, as I said, it's a text to be used in the fourth year of a six-year sequence of the learning of the basic uh, elements of English. Uh, it would probably be used with students who are uh, 14 years old. And you'll see that the text uh, certainly covers a historical period uh, the historical interest is aroused. We learn something about the American Revolution, and not only the historical facts, and I think this is very important, but also uh, we are trying to understand history by way of understanding the feelings that uh, existed at the time, for example, when it says that uh, they hoped to land the tea and things like that. The cultural interest of a more general kind can also be uh, demonstrated here. Uh, for example, the importance for tea with British people can be mentioned, uh, the whole uh, background of the uh, coming into existence of the United States. The teacher can uh, take a moment out to speak about the principles of government in a democracy. He can, uh, and I think this is a, a subject that has been interesting in Germany for 20 years and that has been interesting in this country for two years. He can speak about the problem of civil disobedience and so on. 
this text uh, offers itself to all these purposes. And I think it's a rather good text also because it uh, strengthens uh, motivation. Uh, quite a bit of direct speech is used here, while it is not exclusively a dialogue. There's a certain excitement felt, a certain tension, and of course there's also an illustration which, and this transparency, as you realize, is not very good, but it's quite nice and uh, pretends to be a little bit of a contemporaneous picture of the situation at that time. So now when the teacher at home has understood what he's going to teach and uh, of course he's going to read the rest of the lesson too, although during the first uh, class period in which he's going to use this unit, he is probably only going to introduce part one of this new lesson text. We all usually speak of lessons. Uh, the next step at home in his preparation is to prepare the presentation and especially to prepare the presentation of the vocabulary. And this is quite an important aspect of the direct method. Uh, the teacher will look up uh, in the back of the book the pages where the new vocabulary is listed. And this is the closest we get to translation. For the teacher, these pages have the purpose of showing him what vocabulary in this lesson is new. For the student, these pages have the purpose, once these things have been studied at school, to have a chance to look up some things that he may have forgotten on, uh, while he was walking home. Uh, but this page is never opened in the lesson during the class meeting. The teacher uh, prepares his uh, uh, ideas of how he wants to present this new vocabulary in the foreign language without using the German language, in this case the mother language, of course. In the elementary courses, he will uh, do so by bringing as many objects as he can or pictures, or he will also enact certain things. The teacher must always be a kind of an actor under the direct method. In intermediate courses like this one, the teacher can use certain descriptions and even definitions of terms. So now uh, we can uh, speak of the classroom procedure right away. The teacher has prepared himself about uh, this vocabulary of part one, and uh, I think I counted at home for this part one, there are about 15 new words to be prepared. As he uh, goes about studying this new lesson in the classroom, he will first, as we say, start his Einstimmung. Uh, he will be setting the tune for the whole uh, situation. Uh, in this case, I would uh, begin something like, uh, do you remember what our last lesson but one was about? And some uh, pupils might give the wrong answer. It was about London in the 18th century, and I will tell him, no, that was our last lesson. I said the last lesson but one, and that will remind the student of this expression. And that lesson happened to be about the Pilgrim Fathers, and that, of course, gives us the chance to go on and ask, uh, now, uh, what did the Pilgrim Fathers found? And the answer would have to be colony. Uh, is uh, that country still a colony of Britain today? Of course not, the students know that much. And this gives us uh, the chance to go into this new subject. And the teacher begins to introduce the vocabulary. I have just uh, picked a few examples. For example, to be bound for is uh, indicated here. Where is it? Uh, I would uh, say something like um, the Pilgrim Fathers that we read about a few weeks ago, uh, were they bound for the northern part of the colonies or were they bound for a southern colony? Uh, possibly the students don't know that and I'll explain. They were bound for Virginia. Did they arrive in Virginia? No, they didn't arrive in Virginia, but when they left, they were bound for. Uh, now, uh, you may not understand bound for yet, but a few weeks ago I was in Hamburg and I saw a big ship, and it had a very strange name, and I asked where this ship was bound for, and I was told that the ship was bound for Bombay, and I really should have liked to go there myself. Now, you may have read in the newspaper about Queen Mary. Uh, she was often bound for New York, and on her way back she was bound for Southampton. Do you know what she was bound for on her last trip? By this time, I would expect that the student understands the expression. <laughs> Uh, this, of course, is boring to you, but as, as I said, I have to use examples in English to begin with. Um, I would be trying, as you realize, to introduce a recent event that the students may have read about in the newspapers. I would try to, make, uh, to take examples uh, that are close to the students' everyday life. And, uh, as I showed you, I would be asking questions. And in, my, uh, in reply to my last question, do you know what uh, country, what state, the Queen uh, Mary was bound for on her last trip, um, the student would be forced to uh, use this expression bound for. 
And this is active use. The student has not yet seen the uh, word. As I said, he never sees uh, this uh, page uh, during the uh, introduction of the new lesson. He would have to use it. He gets the understanding by ear. The auditive uh, word, he uh, begins to link the impression that it reaches his ear with a certain meaning. And I would try to uh, ask a few more questions, to ask a few more students uh, to use this expression. I thought of perhaps uh, asking a question of what, what country was Robinson Crusoe bound for uh, when he started his trips and things like that. The activities that we uh, have at this moment is first the listening, which is supposed to be the first, and the speaking. Uh, I may have even ask the class, and some teachers do this regularly, to uh, use a certain sentence and to speak it in chorus. Speaking in chorus is considered quite important, especially in those schools where we don't have language labs yet. Uh, then after a while, I will write this word uh, on the blackboard, to be bound for, and they'll ask a few more questions. And now the students, while again speaking and using the word actively, will also be reading the word at the same time. We, uh, they do not yet write in this presentation of the new lesson. For example, I might ask a question, uh, what port, what harbor are people usually bound for when they go by ship to the United States today? And this again is a question that uh, they can answer from their general knowledge of geography and they would, uh, it would give them a chance to uh, use the expression. You see, it takes quite a bit of time. And uh, of course, with all my explanations, more time even uh, yet uh, was spent so uh, the, um, yes, I think I should mention this uh, too. Uh, I, I would take about uh, one minute at least for the explanation of each new word. And uh, as I said that I'm trying first to link up the uh, signifiant auditif, as the French call it, the uh, signifying thing which you hear with that which it signifies, the signifié. Uh, I think the theory in this country is that after a certain while, possibly weeks later, you would be introducing the signifiant visuel, that is to say, that which means something and which can be seen, the written word, and then in its turn it would have to be linked up with the signifié, with that which is meant. The problem to me seems to be that actually the two remain quite separate, and the student will even be in a danger of not understanding that the two signifié are identical. The uh, general attitude that we have in our country is that we should try and create a unit of the three things. The signifié, which would be the meaning. The signifiant, that which means, which actually has two sides. It's not two different things. It's two sides of one thing. The signifiant auditif, the meaningful thing that you hear. And the signifiant visuel, the meaningful thing that you see. And it's this unit that we try to establish as early as possible. And that's the reason why we give the spelling and the writing of new words just after they have been introduced uh, in uh, listening and speaking exercises. So that the student, as I said, will uh, conceive of the word as a unit rather than as being different separate things. Of course, the things, it's an entirely different thing whether you write a thing or whether you uh, hear a thing, whether you speak a thing or whether you see it uh, from the scientific point of view. But I think for the teaching, these things must be taken quite closely together. I don't think I should take uh, too many uh, examples now. I've prepared a few. I uh, do think I should emphasize that we try to multiply the situations. We would not only be using the situation of the lesson. We would uh, be using situations uh, of the classroom, for example, to be uneasy, which is the last one right here. I think I would uh, use the example now what happens when you go to school and you know there's going to be a test and you uh, uh, have not prepared at all for it. Uh, then. Uh, the student will feel what happens, but he won't know the expression yet. And then I give him the clue. He feels the need for a certain expression. And I, when I have created this need for him uh, to know what something means in the foreign language, he may not even be thinking of a particular word in German in his mother language. He, may, he just feels the situation and he feels the need to express the situation in words. And then I give him the foreign language word and he links up that situation immediately with the foreign language word. Uh, and uh, as I said, we use different situations. School situations are exploited quite heavily. Or in a situation to be willing to, uh, when we want to explain this uh, expression, to be willing to, we might take the old example of uh, John wanting an apple and uh, he can't get at it. So he asks Jack. 
he uh, can't get at the apple either because he's a small boy. Then Peter comes along, he's a tall boy. He could get at the apple, but he says, that's not our tree, we must not take apples from that tree. So uh, while he could uh, take the apple, he is not willing to do it. Very, very simple situations, but, and I think I uh, should stress it once more, situations all the time. No translation, and, uh, well, in later times we may get some definitions, but uh, the situation is so much more lively, it gives so much more motivation that we decided usually to uh, explain something in a given situation. And uh, one advantage that you have while you spend a lot of time, and this can be considered as a loss of time really, uh, but the advantage is that all the time you are using structures, very simple structures, structures that the student understands, and he gets a, a lot of exercise in hearing and understanding the language. The active use of the new expressions by the student assures that these new words stick very easily in his mind. Every once in a while we say, when it's very, very hard and when you would have to spend a very, very long time to make an expression clear, then you might just as well, in exceptional cases, give the mother language words. This just goes to show that we do not uh, preach the principle for its own sake. We uh, preach it for its effectiveness. But one thing that I have noticed was that when I explained a word like nevertheless, and I said, well, this is hard to explain, and it corresponds quite closely to the German expression nicht desto weniger. Afterwards, when we read the text, I noticed that they, oh, you notice when a student reads the text, whether he understands or whether he doesn't understand. So I would ask them, do you understand nevertheless? No, I don't. I don't know what it means. But uh, they would understand what I have explained in situation all the time. So this uh, shows the effectiveness, really, of the direct method uh, vocabulary introduction. We, of course, also use tapes. And uh, before the student is expected and even allowed to open the book that he has with this lesson, I would, uh, and I've done it quite often, I would put the tape on the recorder. I haven't got a tape for this uh, book here now. Uh, but the student uh, would be expected to listen at this uh, unit, at this text. I would even do something that I uh, stop uh, the tape after one sentence, make the students repeat, and then rewind it. After a while, you get it, uh, very, uh, you get it into your fingers to know how far you have to rewind it. And it seems to be a technical problem, but it really isn't when you've done it a few times. You rewind it, you give the student a chance to listen again and uh, to correct his mistakes. And here we get to the question of the correction. Under the active method, the teacher is invited, and I should even say expected, uh, not to correct the students himself, but to invite other students to do the correcting. The students are trained to listen critically, and of course, uh, they will also have to learn to avoid their own mistakes in order to be able to discover other students' mistakes. So uh, whenever the teacher can uh, delegate any task, any duty to a student, he will do it. We'll get more examples of that. Then when the students have heard the text, uh, the teacher may decide either to replay the whole text on the tape or he uh, uh, makes the students open the books and now the student sees the text, he has heard it, he knows what it is all about, he has seen the different words in writing already, individually, he has used them in context, uh, orally, and now he can read the text and it depends on the difficulty of an individual text. Uh, whether I uh, make the students uh, translate uh, certain passages of it. In this case, I'm sure I would not allow the students to translate any part of the text. They would not have heard any part of the uh, situation here in German, in their mother language, in this uh, particular course. Uh, also, uh, when it's a difficult text, I might decide to read the, stu the text of the students sentence by sen sentence and then to make the students repeat uh, one sentence after the other. Or when it's easy, I might invite the students to read the text right away. That depends very much on the difficulty of the individual unit of the individual lesson. Uh, we sometimes, again, make the students read lesson texts in chorus because uh, this is one of the best ways of getting the students to speak. Uh, I personally feel that we must have uh, assured that most of them know the correct pronunciation before we let them speak in chorus. I think we should be careful to avoid the students, to avoid giving the students a chance to uh, pronounce sentences of the pronunciation of which they may not be very uh, sure. Uh, this certainly would fill a whole 45-minute period, and the 45-minute period is a regular thing in Germany. 
And now I would set a homework to the uh, students. Uh, the students are in school in the morning only, the morning meaning until, let's say, about one o'clock. Then they go home, they have their lunch at home. In most cases, it's an exceptional situation where they stay at school. And uh, they are expected to do some independent work. And I think it's quite a good training also uh, to train the students toward a kind of responsibility toward work to uh, give them the duty to do it at home. Of course, they can very easily avoid doing all their homework, and the teacher will not always have the possibility to check everything, although uh, at the beginning grades we do quite a bit of checking. But the, I think the student must be given a chance to show that he's mature enough to realize how important it is to do some work of his own. I usually tell my students uh, that uh, being a pupil, a student, is really a full-day job, and not only a half-day job. Uh, we do try, of course, to give the students a chance to relax and to play and to go to so-called extracurricular activities uh, in the afternoon. I want to emphasize one point. We do not expect uh, in this homework, our, we do not expect our students to memorize this text. As a matter of fact, I warn them against it. I will usually ask them to copy the uh, lesson as far as we've studied in school, as far as we've read it in school, and I may even uh, tell them to copy the new vocabulary, including the translation. But uh, I tell them uh, next time, I'm going to ask you questions about this new lesson, about this situation, and you better prepare this lesson well enough to be able to answer my questions. At a level like this, which would be a fourth uh, level in uh, German, I would even expect the students to be prepared to ask some questions about the text themselves, and they would then get the permission uh, to uh, tell who must answer the question, and this uh, provides some uh, nice uh, motivation when the students get a chance to act as though they were the teacher. They usually like that quite a bit. Again, the teacher will try to uh, call the student to do as much as the student can do in class, and he will expect the student to take uh, as much of the teacher's job as he can. Uh, the student then, uh, after ha he has copied the lesson at home as his homework, he will uh, have to read the lesson several times for understanding. When he copies it, he will be paying attention to the individual word rather than to the overall meaning. And this is a good thing, uh, but uh, the reading for understanding, the reading for meaning, certainly is a very important part in the direct method, and uh, the student must be able to answer free questions. And uh, I usually tell my students, I will ask my questions in such a way that if you memorize the sentences, and if you use a sentence literally from the book, it will be a mistake. Example, what was the cargo of the three ships? The correct answer would be the cargo was tea. But when the student asks the three ships with the cargo of China tea were crossing the ocean, it's not an answer to my question. I would consider that as a mistake. So the student must know what he is speaking about. He must realize that he's always using language as language, that is to say as communication of ideas, and not just uh, think of the language as being something formal, as being a structure. The language most certainly is structure, but it is not only structure. The uh, next class session then will begin with a uh, conversation about this uh, particular part of the lesson, and then the teacher will go on uh, preparing the second part and later the third part of the lesson. Uh, sometimes what I, I tell my students when we have this little conversation about uh, the lesson part that we have studied, I tell them to use the new vocabulary. And sometimes I even say, you may not have realized it, but what I'm doing right now is testing your vocabulary. And sometimes they're surprised at that because we were talking about America all the time. Uh, but again, uh, I want the students to be able to use the new vocabulary in situations. It's very rare that we check a vocabulary uh, understanding by way of word lists, putting the German word on one side and then expecting the student to give the other one. We do it every once in a while, but not very often. This principle uh, might be called, using the language in context, I mean, might be called contextualism. And it is one principle that has been uh, of uh, considerable importance ever since there has been a, a direct method. I have applied this uh, principle uh, in the last school year, even in corrections. The tendency used to be, when the students made mistakes in writing, in spelling, they were told when it's the spelling mistake in an individual word, you write the word three times, so you'd know how it is to be written. But when it's a mistake in structure, in word order and things like that, then you better write the whole sentence, so you understand what the sentence is. 
Well, I've had it happen quite often that students wrote sentences like John have seen, and then I, I told them have is wrong, and they said, oh good, this is a short word, and it's a spelling mistake, and he w they would write has, has, has. And that, of course, is nonsense. Uh, so uh, last year I decided to make my students, uh, even in little corrections of just one word, write out the whole sentence, even if it was a three-line sentence, and they made just a little mistake, left out one letter. You write the whole sentence, and that's all there is to it. And I did notice, in some cases, the result that the students, after a while, had a hard time talking in German about these subjects that had been covered in these units. They were groping for their German words. The English words would be coming easy, more easily to their minds. And I felt that this was the success that we were striving for. I don't say we succeeded with all the students every time, but uh, I wanted to mention this as the goal that we are striving to reach. After part uh, three of this uh, particular lesson, we might go on if we feel that we have time uh, with some additional side lessons. You may notice that the B part of the lesson is in brackets. Uh, and this indicates that this is not a necessary part of the uh, teaching course. It's a lesson about the uh, different uh, flags of Britain and America. And also, as you see, there is the, national, uh, the American National Anthem here, which uh, can be used if the teacher feels that he is short of time, and uh, I think teachers are very apt to feel that quite often. Uh, he can just uh, forget about these things and tell the students, when you want to read some, uh, something additional, you read this, it's quite interesting, but we don't have the time to cover this in class. And then he would be going into doing exercises in connection with the lesson. For example, this is a situation a motivated exercise in which the student will have to show his understanding of the lesson as such. Uh, the uh, question that is asked, uh, you may have noticed these uh, exercises in this particular book are in the back of the book. They do not follow the text. You first have only the texts and then in the back of the book you have all the exercises. And uh, the uh, rule here, the question-answer exercise, actually is again a new situation. A letter from England. John Hancock, one of the colonists, has received a letter from a friend in England. The friend asks him, one, when did the three tea ships arrive in Boston Harbor? And the student will be expected either only to give the answer or to uh, copy the question and write an answer to it, and so on. It uh, is a situation that clearly relates with the text of the unit, but uh, it is a new situation which was not exactly as such in the text. And this uh, also uh, gives a new motivation to this student. When we go on and uh, have more exercises, those exercises will be about grammar. And I said before that we do teach grammar, but we teach it differently from the way it had been taught formerly. Uh, and I think I must explain that now. I think the word to use, and that is always used back home, is we teach grammar no longer in the deductive way, but the, in the inductive way. Deductive grammar would be to state a rule and then to make the students apply the rule in individual sentences. It would also be deductive to say this is the pattern and now you form several patterns, several sentences according to this pattern. This is deductive teaching, stating a general law and then making the student apply it. Inductive teaching is different. Uh, the, the student learns to use the patterns and the structures without realizing exactly that they are new structures. As a matter of fact, in this lesson that we have been studying here, uh, quite a few of these new structures have been embodied and I wonder whether you have felt in reading this lesson that uh, any particular grammatical aspect was overemphasized in this lesson. I wonder whether you felt that uh, very clearly this lesson is geared to one particular uh, structure in English. Uh, I think you are the only ones who can judge. I couldn't. No, the student would be expected to know that by this time. I'll show you. You see how many examples really there are for this to be studied. It's the different use of mo modal, modal auxiliaries in English and in German. Uh, you have first, uh, and I'll have to turn to my book here, just a moment. Uh, the um, colonists were to pay a tax. This were to pay would probably not even appear to be a modal auxiliary to you. Actually, it corresponds in German to the verb sollen. The uh, 
colonisten sollten bezahlen they were to pay and uh, it happens to be quite a difficult use because this particular structure of english this to be to in the meaning of having an obligation to do something is quite difficult for german students to understand so there are several examples of that the next example we won't pay a penny the student here must learn to understand that we won't implies two things that, that seem to be separate from the german way of thinking one is that they don't want to and the second thing is that they are not going to do it and the student must realize that this uh, that these two things actually are expressed in we won't be there might be trouble here the student will have to be explained uh, that it will have to be explained to the student that uh, might uh, is uh, corresponding to a german it is a modal auxiliary for one thing but it corresponds to the german vielleicht which is actually an adverb and uh, differences like this so you see there are uh, all these examples and the teacher can now go ahead and point out some of these constructions he would not be pointing them out the way i'm doing here all of them at a time he would be pointing at the different to be two structures and at the use of shall and so on and he will also make the students use some of these structures in reply to questions that he asks about the lesson while the student still thinks he's talking about the american revolution uh, excuse me the american war of independence and um, the <laughs> Uh, the, st the teacher will write some of the answer that the students have given on the blackboard and then he will underscore certain expressions and the student will realize that these expressions are all alike and then the student will be expected under the guidance of the teacher to uh, understand the principle by which these expressions are used inductive learning and I think it's very important that we do that this is grammar study of course and i know grammar study is not is not very popular with students back home and it's not very popular with teachers here um i think it's necessary though because if we do not give the student a chance to explain what he would be worrying about anyhow he would try to rationalize by himself and he's very apt to find wrong and false explanations and uh, he will try he will uh, establish principles in his thinking he may not even be doing that consciously but he will feel oh yes that's the general rule and i'll have to do it this way and he may be all wrong and that's why this will have to be done under the guidance of the teacher who of course can always correct the uh, direction in which the discussion may be going sentences that i would use to explain this uh, this structure to be to would be the following uh, the other day uh, a person came here to our door and he said the pupil Maya is to go to the principal's office who has the desire that the student should go there is it the man who came no certainly not is it the pupil himself probably not is the teacher in the classroom no it's a third person uh, it is the principal evidently or uh, I will say uh, pupil was not present last time and his comrade his friend tells him we are to do exercises four and five again i would try uh, 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 the, to make the students understand that it is a person who is not really present who has this desire i would try to make the student understand the situation in which this structure to be to is used in the english language bloomfield was very uh, expressive in uh, saying that um, language is not logical and i think it is true grammar never is logical but grammar expresses certain situations that can be how should i say expressed in uh, logical terms and this is what the student wants to do the student wants to understand that uh, why he goes to school if ever he goes to school for any reason except that his uh, parents send him and uh, I think we should try uh, to help our students to feel that they want to understand. And this is where this kind of grammar study comes in. I do not have the grammar handbook that will go with this book. I'll show you an example uh, in, of a French grammar handbook. The student will be expected to study, study these uh, things as they are set out in the grammar handbook. And the teacher, uh, I think, should be gearing his explanations as uh, well as he can to the explanations given in the grammar handbook 
so that the student really feels at home. He can do something that has been done in school. He can repeat something. The explanation given in the grammar handbook and by the teacher, the two explanations should uh, be related to each other. And then when the student has uh, understood and studied uh, the grammar as such, uh, and has studied it, indu it inductively, he will of course have to apply these grammar rules, but not uh, in thinking of the rule all the time. As a matter of fact, I encourage the students never to memorize a rule, and I think there's only one or two exceptions to these rules. That would be the endings of the participle uh, combined with et or avoir in French. That's the rule that I make them memorize, and I think it's the only one. But the students are expected to use the um, uh, language in thinking of the situation. And here, of course, uh, the situation, the ex exercises are always, again, new situations. For those who may not be able to see uh, what I have on the pr in the projection here, exercise two says the tea ships arrive. And then there's a little indication what the student must do. Use either don't or will you please with the sentences and put a question, put in a question mark, excuse me, and put in a question mark where necessary. And then the situation that was started in exercise one, John Hancock has got a letter from England. This situation is spun on. John Hancock talks to some of his friends after the arrival of the tea ships. Another st student uh, uses these patterns, and this, uh, he must decide whether he puts in don't or will you please. Uh, don't come to the meeting tonight wouldn't make any sense, so he says, will you please come to the meeting tonight? Will you please tell all our friends about the meeting? Don't tell the British soldiers about the meeting. <laughs> will you please go down to the harbor and look where the tea ships are? Will you don't help to... Uh, unload the tea ships. Um, don't forget your hatchets. <laughs> uh, will you please go to the British governor and give him a letter from me? Will you please be at the meeting house at nine o'clock tonight? Then exercise three. Uh, you see what is to be done. We won't and we don't want to. These two different expressions are to be used. We won't unload the ships. Oh yes, a lot of colonists have come to the meeting. One of them makes a speech. We won't unload the tea ships. Why not? Because we don't want to buy British tea. We won't buy British tea. Why not? We don't want to pay taxes to England. We won't pay taxes to England, and so on. Uh, it's quite a harangue, actually. Then, exercise four. An officer brings orders from the British governor to the colonists at the meeting house. You are to go home at once. You are to come to the harbor tomorrow morning. You are to help unload the tea ships. You are to leave your weapons at home. You are to buy English tea. You see, it's the difficult structures that will be practiced with this, by the students. You are to pay threepence tax on every pound of tea, and you are to obey all orders from the governor. A colonist gets up and says, tell the governor that we are free men. We needn't go home. We can not stay here at the meeting house if we wish. We needn't come to the harbor tomorrow morning. We can stay at home. The student must uh, add a meaningful sentence that is not given to him. We needn't help unload the tea ships. The tea can stay where it is. And so on. Then, part C. Another speaker gets up and says, don't be so angry, angry with the British. Aren't we British ourselves? I think we ought to help unload the tea ships. I think we ought not to shoot at the British soldiers. I think we ought not to carry any weapons. And so on. You see, it is pattern drill, but it's, it is pattern drill within a situation, and thus it remains language. It is not patter. It is talking. It is speaking. It is meaningful. And we think this is so important. Then part D. One of the colonists shouts angrily, a man who says that we should help unload the tea ships cannot be, and so on. Uh, and uh, the uh, student is given a chance to write out quite a few, and of course also to speak, quite a few more uh, sentences like this. Part five, exercise five, the governor talks to an officer. And here, the student will have to make a choice of quite a few of these modal auxiliaries. Can, shall, should, are, to, need, or will, whichever is correct. Governor, go and talk to the captains of the tea ships. My orders are that they uh, should unload the tea tomorrow or, or that they are to unload the tea tomorrow, the a student will have to decide, and so on. Exercise six, planning an attack. A colonist asks, 
What can we do to stop the British from selling us their tea? Shall we burn the governor's, the governor's house? Other colonists reply, that may be dangerous for our own houses. Shall we capture the governor? He may not be at home. Shall we form an army? We may not have enough uh, weapons. Shall we go to war against England? We may not be strong enough. Shall we destroy the harbor? That may mean to destroy our own ships. Shall we sink the tea ships? That may make the harbor useless. Shall we throw the tea into the sea? That may be a good idea. <laughs> and then exercise seven, after the tea party, after the tea party, the wife, is, yes, it's right. Uh, the wife of one of the colonists asked her husband, shouldn't you have been more careful? You might have lost your life. I should point out here that here the structure, shouldn't you have been? The use of the model auxiliary in the uh, past tense is quite complicated for German students. And here again a situation has been devised in which the students feel that this is uh, more or less natural after all. Shouldn't you have stayed away from the meeting house? you might have got shot at. Shouldn't you have taken your gun with you? You might have needed it, and so on and so on. Uh, part B, some of the colonists are afraid that England will soon send more soldiers to America. I think they will start a war. I think they will take our farms away from us, and so on. Others reply, this part B isn't very important from the grammatical point of view, but then others reply, even if they should start a war, we mustn't be afraid. And I should point out here to those who don't know German that mustn't is represented by an entirely different verb in German, wir dürfen nicht. And the tendency of Germans would be to use may rather than must uh, when they uh, write out sentences like this. So the students are given chance, uh, chances to write even if um, they should start a war, we mustn't panic and so on. And the sentences uh, given before are to be used. You have, may have realized by now that when the students have written out these exercises, what they have done actually is that they have written a short story about the American Revolution, uh, the American War of Independence. And um, this is uh, a point uh, to which this uh, direct method can be carried. It's not always carried that far. And this is actually the reason why I selected this lesson to show you how far you can go in devising uh, situations in which grammar can be used grammar that has been introduced inductively and grammar that is used similarly to pattern drills but grammar that always remains within a context. The following story uh, leaves this context. It's a, a series of pictures in which the student can and is expected to tell a certain story that he uh, takes from the pictures. In uh, exercise 9, you see a translation. Exercises 8 and 9 would not be uh, supposed uh, to be necessary exercises. Exercise 8 is an exercise which the uh, representatives of the traditional direct method, to use that expression, might use. That is to say, those people who feel that they never must use any translation. There are some left who feel that way, and I think there are more of them in northern Germany than there are in southern Germany, I don't know why. Uh, but uh, these people would uh, expect their students to write out this story. Uh, other uh, teachers, including myself, feel that translation can be used, not as a teaching method, but as a testing method. And here's a little uh, story again in, uh, Engl in German. Uh, it's, uh, of course, the sentences are very easy. They are devised for the purpose. They are not an original German text to be translated into English. That is something that even goes, I should say, beyond the tasks of the foreign language teacher. That is a special task for interpreters and translators. But these sentences are simple enough for students to translate them. Maybe you are interested uh, what, how it runs. I'll try to translate it right now. Uh, no tea for Mr. Connor. The Settlers, who had been uh, disguised as Indians, were on their way to the harbor. Have your guns ready, said their leader to them, John, Han said Han John Hancock, their leader to them. But you should not shoot before the sailors 
shoot at you. And do not forget, or don't forget, you must not, here is this dürft, ihr dürft nicht, you must not touch anything except the tea. In the harbor the men had to wait some time until everything was quiet on the ships, then they could go on board. When they had almost finished throwing the tea into the water, John Hancock saw one of his men filling the pockets of his jacket with tea. Mr. Connor, you ought to be ashamed. You could have stayed at home, more auxiliary in the past tense, you could have stayed at home if this was all you wanted to do. Please take off your jacket and throw it into the water. Later, when the people heard about it, they all laughed at poor Mr. Connor. He had to walk home without his jacket uh, through the cold winter night. Again, it is a situation and uh, it relates to the uh, main situation of the unit. What remains here is an interesting feature that has been introduced by this one pub publisher. Let's prepare lesson 15, the next lesson. Here uh, some grammar features are introduced before the new lesson is studied with very simple vocabulary so that the student has an idea of what these new structures may mean. This is not done every time. As a matter of fact, it was not done with this unit, with this lesson number 14. Uh, but it's just one possibility of avoiding some of the uh, greater difficulties for the student uh, when he studies a new unit so that he will be able to understand it. There are also uh, suggestions for additional oral drills. All these drills, of course, are written drills and are to be uh, written by the students. But the teacher's handbooks, of which some uh, copies are back there on the tables, um, will give the teacher quite a few suggestions for additional oral drills. And then, of course, I think every teacher can be expected to develop a few of such drills himself. As a matter of fact, I think most teachers do it anyway very often on the spur of the moment. I'll show you an example of that again later when I show you some uh, things from the French teaching books. Sometimes we have vocabulary drills. Oh yes, before I speak about the vocabulary, I should show you some of the typical uh, pattern drills. Uh, there didn't happen to be any real pattern drills in this particular lesson, but here is one uh, lesson. Uh, it's a different context, of course, where you get the, these pattern drills. I mentioned them last time as being a feature that was introduced in our uh, German uh, books, in our German teaching manuals, uh, as a feature of structuralism. Here the students uh, will be expected, uh, well, I usually make the students uh, find out how many sentences they can form with the material that is given to them. And usually, usually the number is uh, quite fantastic. Uh, here again, a different uh, pattern a drill. By the way, the blue tags here, uh, they are originally in the book and they, rip, uh, they show the exercises that should be done by every class, whereas other exercises that don't have this blue tag can be left out. This, I think, is quite a nice one. The policeman let the boy telephone his parents or made the boy telephone his parents, and the student would be expected to know the difference. Or the policeman got the thief put in prison, the policeman had the thief put in prison. And then, of course, the student would uh, have to know the difference be uh, between this structure and the policeman had put the thief in prison. Uh, so the student gets a chance to do real drills, and uh, whereas the material may be from the lesson, this gets much closer to the kind of pattern drills that are advocated by the uh, uh, structuralists. And I just wanted to show you these to uh, show you that um, I had not exaggerated last time when I said that we have adopted some of these new methods in our teaching. In the vocab on the vocabulary pages, uh, there may be special vocabulary drills. For example, here is a list of uh, uh, expressions with to have, to have a walk, to have tea, to have a look at something. Uh, the student needs uh, this kind of survey every once in a while just to see how widely the verb is used and how many different expressions can be formed with it. Other vocabulary exercises will include uh, comparisons that they may have studied at a particular time. One feature that has been newly developed is a new kind of lab drills. The foreign language lab was introduced in Germany just a few years ago, but we felt that the uh, traditional pattern exercises did not fit in with the uh, contextualist uh, uh, concept of foreign language teaching that characterizes foreign language teaching under the direct method. 
So uh, some efforts have been made, and this is about the most recent thing that has been happening in Germany before I left. Some efforts have been made to have context motivation lab drills developed by those who can do them. Uh, Mr. Bauer, who was here in Minneapolis a short time ago, developed this one, and this is from a collection of 20 drills that he published uh, last year. And uh, let's, uh, it's uh, one thing that I could use together with the lesson that we studied. It's the use of uh, uh, some of the modal auxiliaries. If uh, we were millionaires is the title. This is the language uh, labor laboratory drill, practicing conditional sentences. First, just listen to John and Mary. If we did the football pools, we might become millionaires. Mary. And if we became millionaires, if we became millionaires, we wouldn't work anymore. Mary. And if we didn't work anymore, if we didn't work anymore, we'd go on a journey around the world. Mary. And if we went on a journey around the world, if we went on a journey around the world, we'd stay at the best hotels. And if we stayed at the best hotels, you see, uh, it characterizes even the person. This repetition very often characterizes a certain type of person. If we stayed at the best hotels, we'd wear the most expensive clothes. And if we wore the most expensive clothes, if we wore the most expensive clothes, we'd, be, we'd belong to high society, and so on. If we belong to high society, we'd know many important people. If we knew many important people, we'd give wonderful parties. If we gave wonderful parties, we'd spend all our money. If we spend all our money, we'd soon be poor. If we were poor, we'd have to do the football pools again. <laughs> Mr. Bauer, uh, who lives in Munich, is very, very good at this uh, kind of thing. Uh, to have this uh, little expectation that the students who do this kind of uh, test, they know that there's going to be something at the end and they are looking forward to it and this adds immensely to their motivation. He's not the only one to prepare a test like this. This is a, a lab drill that was prepared in connection uh, with people of the Institute for, Fil for Film and uh, uh, Pictures, Institute for Film and Bild in Munich, and uh, some uh, of their publications are in the back. They have a slide series, they have tapes, and they have films, and especially there is one catalog, I think I've got it here, or did it remain in the back? I think it did. Uh, anyway, you should uh, look at it because it contains some material. Here it is, film built on tone. Some materials that some of you may be able to use, especially German teachers, because uh, it's uh, German plays, taped, and so on. But also in other foreign languages, such as French, there are some materials. And you may want to look at this uh, afterwards. And you can, of course, always get this catalog yourselves if you just jot down the address. This drill here uh, uh, shows you how this uh, lab drill would be used. Of course, just listening wouldn't do the job. I've edited this drill a little bit, uh, so we don't spend uh, so very much time on it. And I should say that, of course, all of these tapes are prepared with the aid of foreign speakers, that is to say, speakers who use that language as their mother language. And uh, it is uh, as natural that uh, the feminine parts would be spoken by uh, ladies. Narrator, Sally and Jim are on holiday, they are in Wales. Wales is a very beautiful country in the west of Britain. It has many lovely mountains and rivers. Most of the people of Wales speak Welsh, but they can all speak English as well. They learn English in school. Gong, end of part one. Part two, repeat the sentences. Sally and Jim are on holiday, the pupil repeats. Sally and Jim are on holiday, the pupil repeats. That is to say, four-phase drill repetition, not just two-phase. The student can listen to the correct pronunciation once more after he has spoken himself. Then they learn English in school, uh, and so on. That's the end then. Part three, the narrator goes on to tell the story, and the student listens. Sally and Jim are now in a small village in the Welsh mountains. Listen to them. Sally. Oh, look at that hotel by the stream. Isn't it pretty? We could stay there. Jim. Would you like to stay there? You see, this fits in with the modal auxiliaries again. Sally. Yes, I would. And look at that mountain. It's gorgeous. We could climb it tomorrow. Would you like to climb it tomorrow? Hmm, yes. You think we could? And look at that row of houses. We could take a photograph of it. Would you like to take a photograph of it? Yes, let's do that now. I know. You could be in the photograph. Jim. Hmm. Would you like me to be in the photograph? <laughs> you see, this situation adds motivation beyond the situation. It, uh, the, there are human feelings embodied in a text like this. 
Sally. Yes, I would. You, can, you could stand over there. Jim, calling from a distance. Would you like me to stand over here? Sally. Yes, that's right. Uh, could you uh, perhaps lean against that wall? If you have ever traveled with a man or a lady taking pictures, you know what this is all about. <laughs> uh, if you don't, ask my wife, she'll tell you. Uh, would you like me to stand over here? Yes, that's right. And so on. Would you like me to lean against this wall? Yes, that's it. Good. I've taken the photograph. You can come back now. Oh, dear. It's starting to rain. Let's go to the hotel now. Would you like to go to hotel now? <laughs> yes, I would. Come on. <laughs> Car starts and drives away. Gone. Now, here's the conversation again, says the narrator. This time, repeat what Jim says. Repetition drill. Again in the situation, and I don't have to read it all. Next part, number five. Here's the conversation once more, and this is actually what we are aiming at all the time. This time, Jim will not speak. You must speak his part for him. Listen first to the example. And Jim does some of the talking here. Oh, look at that hotel by the stream, and so on. Two examples are given. Are you ready? Start now. Oh, look at that hotel by the stream. Isn't it pretty? We could stay there. And then the student must give Jim's answer. Of course, he knows uh, that before. He is not just uh, surprised. He knows this kind of drill, and the teacher will have to explain that the student will be expected to do that. And you see, this is almost a kind of memorizing already. Uh, and it's uh, quite a difficult exercise, and the student will very often want to do this again before he feels he has done a good job of it. Car starts and drives away. It's not very long. Then the situation goes on. Sally and Jim are in the hotel. They are at the reception desk. They are talking to the receptionist. Listen to them first. Receptionist, good afternoon, Jim. Good afternoon, we'd like a room, please. Receptionist, would you like two single rooms or a double? Jim, should we take a double room? Sally, I think we should. Jim, yes, we'd like a double room, please. You see, he asks first. He's a very good husband. Receptionist, a double room. Yes, we have some double rooms free. Would you like a double bed or twin beds? Jim, should we take twin beds? Sally? Yes, I think we should. <laughs> Jim. Yes, we'd like twin beds, please. Receptionist. A double room with thin beds. Would you like a room uh, with twin beds? Oh, sorry, that's a misprint. <laughs> <laughs> Can't happen, though. <laughs> Didn't notice that before. Would you like a room facing the front or facing the back? Jim, the very good husband. Should we take a room facing the back? <laughs> facing the back? You mean facing the mountains? Yes, I think we should. Jim, yes, we'd like a room facing the back, please. The receptionist, a double room with beds facing the back. Would you like tea in the morning? <laughs> you see, the repetition is not as boring as it were if you were just to repeat the sentence all the time without any meaning to it. It's, after all, it's a kind of situation. Receptionist, would you like tea in the morning? Jim, should we take tea in the morning? <laughs> Sally, yes, I think we should. <laughs> We're almost getting into literature now, aren't we? <laughs> and I tell you, I've tried it. It's very, very hard to write this kind of drill. And it really takes gifted people. And I think we should find those people who can do it, and they should do it. Sally, yes, I think we should. Jim, yes, we'd like tea in the morning, please. Receptionist, your room is number 11. Would you stand the register, please? There'll be someone take, uh, coming to take your luggage upstairs. Part 7, the student is again expected to repeat what Jim says every time and uh, then uh, again this section comes where the student must take uh, Jim's uh, part Jim does not speak you must speak in his place uh, of course it is always very very boring and uh, <laughs> exaggerating it seems to be exaggerating when you read a uh, drill a lab drill a pattern drill to a group who, are, who is not really expected to do the drill but when the student really must learn these things, he is thankful for this repetition, and I think he's also thankful for the fact that it is repetition that means something. Uh, the last part is a, an entirely different kind of exercise uh, once more. Uh, one more exercise, says the narrator. Jim always said yes. How do you say no? Listen, receptionist. Would you like a newspaper in the morning? Sally. No, thank you. We don't want a newspaper in the morning. Narrator, the receptionist will ask you some questions. Say no to each question. After you have spoken, Sally will repeat the right answer. Ready? Receptionist, would you like a taxi in the morning? 
And here there has been no preparation. The student must be able to do this right away now. No, thank you. We don't uh, want to have a text in the morning. Uh, and then the correction, of course, is given afterwards. Sally, no, thank you. We don't want a text in the morning. I didn't do it right. Receptionist, would you like dinner this evening? Would you like to watch te television in the lounge? Would you uh, like kippers for breakfast? Would you like a room with a bath? Would you like to take uh, your tea on the lawn? And that is the end. Quite a few uh, things for a student to learn. It may seem to be a very long drill. That's why I put the exact timing here of these nine parts. Uh, holiday in Wales, well, I can uh, do it here. The narration first uh, takes uh, 30 seconds. Uh, repeating the sentences lasts a minute and 50 seconds. The dialogue, uh, a minute uh, and 59 uh, seconds, that's about two minutes, where the student only listens to the dialogue. Three minutes and 12 seconds uh, when the student repeats what Jim says. Three minutes and two seconds uh, the student must uh, speak the part of Jim. One minute and 30 seconds for the next scene. 2 minutes 50 seconds for repetition, 2 minutes and 28 seconds for uh, speaking the part of Jim, and uh, the last part where the student must say no to his questions lasts 2 minutes and 40 seconds. It's a 20 minute and 24 second drill. Of course, it can very easily be broken down to shorter units. Uh, actually, I had been planning to present this kind of lab drill in a different talk uh, because it uh, actually deserves a more thorough pre uh, presentation. But then, uh, on the other hand, I felt that I had uh, you here once and I don't know how often I'm going to have you again. So I did want to speak about this, at least in this uh, brief manner. You may not have felt it was that brief after all. <coughs> Another important feature in the uh, direct method teaching and one of our purposes is, of course, to uh, enable the students to read in uh, texts. And one way in which we try to uh, uh, enable him to do that is to prepare special texts that were written for him, not texts that were simplified in literature, not, let's say, a simplified edition of Shakespeare or something like that, uh, but uh, special texts for students. I don't think I have the time to read it here. It's a very nice little situation for 12-year-old uh, uh, students, uh, pupils, where a boy and a girl get lost on an island, get stranded, and smugglers come and they help, of course, to unmask them and to hand them over to the police. Uh, I think an important feature of our German text is that they do not contain any suggestions for exercises. I think the student wants to have a chance just to read without being reminded of this being instruction all the time. He wants to read the text for its own interest. Of course, the teacher can always add exercises, but we feel that um, these... Uh, exercises should not always be present. The students do some uh, cursory reading, I think it is called cursorisches Reden, we say. I'm afraid I have uh, gone beyond my time already, and I will just uh, go very briefly through the examples of additional material that uh, this publisher would uh, supply the teacher with. And these are examples uh, from uh, French. Oh, yes. I was going to play you one of these tapes, but I'm afraid I'm not going to do it. Uh, it's a lesson. Uh, where you would uh, have the impression of he hearing different people uh, speak uh, and you would have the advantage of uh, authentic speakers. But I think you have things like that, of course, here. As a matter of fact, uh, many of the things that I've been suggesting here are being done in many schools here. And I'm not suggesting that all this is very new. I do think that we have made these uh, suggestions into a coherent method. And uh, we um, have... Uh, made practical success uh, our uh, standard rather than a theory that should be uh, put into practical use. Uh, one thing that this particular publisher does, and it is the publisher who publishes most foreign language teaching materials in Germany, as certain statistics have shown, is that he gives the student a chance to memorize visually certain things. For example, uh, there are certain kinds of vocabulary exercises where just this, black, uh, back, uh, this bl blue background it gives the student a help to remember, oh yes, that was there, and that stood on this page. And some students are structured that way, I think, that they understand things like uh, in this way a little bit more easily, and, of, and they memorize and remember expressions more easily this way. Uh, this is from a uh, little booklet of definitions, which has been published for the use of teachers who may want to use these definitions in the preparation of the vocabulary. But it can also be given out to students, and the students can be expected to prepare some of that vocabulary on their own before the new uh, uh, text is studied. I have not uh, done that myself, but it's just one of the possibilities. 
that is being offered here. I think I should let you have a, an impression of what a, a grammar looks like in, in Germany. This is from a uh, grammar of the French language. And you see how the publisher tries very hard to make the examples jump into the uh, pupil's eye. Uh, he tries to make the student realize that the example is the important thing. As a matter of fact, quite often there isn't a, the precise wording of a rule. Here, for example, there are only certain words that explain, for example, the different meanings of devoir, which would correspond to something like shall in English. And the different meanings are indicated, for example, je dois me dépêcher, uh, where it's a kind of duty, pflicht in German, but the, different, the meaning is entirely different in il doit être tard, it quite applies to me, I, I think, it must be late by now, uh, a supposition, and the student gets the impression here, starting from the foreign language, of all the things that the foreign uh, language word means, we speak of the word, word field. That is to say, a, a word means several things and spreads over a certain area. And I've uh, uh, chosen this example because it fits in with what I showed you in the, Eng in the English text, but also because I, it shows you our twofold approach. Here uh, you have the uh, similar thing going on, uh, the explanation of the modal auxiliary here in French. And while uh, here uh, we started from the French word, devoir, we start here from the German expression, können, wollen, being able to, wishing to, or uh, it is down here, sollen, having to, being obliged to do something, dürfen, being allowed to do something. And uh, the student is made to realize the different meanings that can be expressed in German too, in his own mother language, uh, by this one word. And uh, the student uh, learns to understand his own speaking better. He learns to realize what he's actually saying when he's using certain words and how he's using certain words in very different meanings. One final uh, impression here, this is a page from a teacher's handbook, and you see how the teacher is given suggestions of drawings. For example, uh, one difficulty is in French uh, that uh, for a German student it's hard to uh, understand the difference between dans and en, uh, the pre prepositions of time, and the teacher is given a hint how to explain this by means of a sketch. Here actually different coloring should be used with these irregular verbs, I don't have the time to go into detail, uh, details of all that. But if you are interested to look at these things, at these uh, transparencies a little bit more closely, I have prepared a few prints of them. And actually, I had planned to put them on the table towards the end of uh, this talk. But it appears that they have all gone. So I asked uh, Dr. Johnson whether it would be a possibility to have more prints of them made. If you are interested, you can get them. Dr. Johnson said yes, and I thank him very much for this uh, uh, possibility. I simplified this one because it was trying to express uh, several things. You can get uh, these uh, things if you please write your name and address on a little bit of paper and drop it into the box that I have on one of these tables in the back. And if you just write, please send me prints of, uh, well, you don't even have to write that. If you just leave your address this time, I'll know that you want uh, prints of these various transparencies and we'll try to get them to you as soon as possible. And uh, if you are interested in looking at some more of these materials, for example, some of the newspapers that are published especially for students, this one happens to be in German, selections from the German press with explanations of the vocabulary in foreign languages or in German. Uh, the sa same thing exists in uh, French, selections from the French uh, newspapers with uh, vocabulary explained and also selections from uh, English newspapers. Of course, these are not so interesting for you, so I have just brought these German newspapers, and they, of course, can be bought by you too and used in class. They are used as one of the means of creating motivation in the classroom. And I think this really is the one big word behind the uh, direct method. We do want to motivate the student to understand and to speak uh, the foreign language, and as I said, to think in it. I thank you very much for your very great patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Ebner. Dr. Ebner is willing to answer questions. We can either entertain him from the floor or if you want to talk to him after the group breaks up. And we also invite you to have a cup of coffee before you leave. Are there any questions that you'd like to direct to him now?
Uh, some uh, books, of course, follow different lines. I feel that this is the best uh, realization of what the method means and wants us to do. I have some other materials at home that I'm not very happy with. And I would not say that they are all of the same quality. No, they are not. But then, of course, other teachers uh, may not feel exactly uh, the way I feel, and uh, they may uh, emphasize other things more uh, from uh, the way I understand the direct method and uh, what it has been written about it. And I want to remind you of the uh, methodologies uh, that have been written. I uh, projected them last time on the screen, and I have the book on the first table here, the book by Schubel and the book by Closet, I think are the most valuable ones. Uh, I think that this book uh, corresponds most closely, and this series of books, this kind of books, I should say, because actually there are quite a few of them, and you will see some of them in the back. I think they correspond most closely to what the direct method and the active method really wants us to do. One other question. How much training would a teacher have This will be my particular subject uh, two weeks, uh, uh, in two weeks. Uh, the general idea is that the student, uh, he will have uh, studied the language certainly during his high school days, uh, at least three years. Then he will have gone to the university and studied the language for a minimum of four years. Usually it's five and sometimes it's six years. And then uh, he passes his so-called first state board examination, the Erste Staatsexamen, in which he is tested about his knowledge of the language as such. And then he goes into two years of teacher training where he gets the methodological background, uh, where he is uh, given chances to practice, and then he's evaluated, and then he uh, goes into his second uh, um, uh, state board examination, that's right, the Staats examen, and then he is a more or less full-fledged teacher. And I believe it's not wasting time. Yes? How yes? about the evaluation of the results of your teaching in the individual school? Is there any sort of standardization Yes, uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, it, there seems to be quite a legalistic approach to evaluation and uh, the records, uh, the tests have to be kept in the school offices for a minimum of two years. The difficulty is that the oral uh, work cannot be stored in the same way and this it seems to be one unfortunate reason why the oral uh, uh, activities of the students do not get uh, the uh, amount of evaluation and the amount of value attributed to them that they actually deserve. Uh, the tests usually are, uh, well, what do you call them, the standardized tests or the, uh, where the student checks a certain answer or something like that. It's not this kind. As a matter of fact, there seems to be a, perhaps even a prejudice uh, against them. I personally share the prejudice, I must say quite frankly, the so-called standardized uh, or um, what was another expression? Uh, uh, multiple, choice. multiple choice tests and another one, the Object objective. objective, yes. Yeah. The objective test to me does not seem to give the student a chance even to handle the language. It reminds him of certain things and he says, oh yes, this seems to be the closest to what I think is right. And uh, I may be wrong. I have not gone very deeply into this question and uh, I'd like some suggestions from you, but uh, the student at home will have to write a dictation most of the time uh, the dictation, uh, and he will not only just fill in a few gaps that have been left by the teacher, he'll have to write the whole text. And uh, you will be surprised how often it happens that even advanced uh, students will make uh, mistakes with this and this, uh, getting the two mixed up. Uh, the student really must uh, be quite good to be able to write out everything. He is given adequate time, of course. And then uh, very often there are translations of the type that I showed you, specially prepared texts which would be embodying certain principles that we had been talked about uh, and had been taught uh, before. Then a very good kind of test, which takes a long time to correct, is the reproduction in which uh, the <coughs> student, the class, is told a story uh, twice, and then the student has to rewrite in the foreign uh, language. Of course, the story is told in the foreign language, too. Uh, some critics of this uh, kind of test say it's very much a memory test, but then I think uh, most students will forget the individual uh, wording of the individual phrase, and uh, they will have to write meaningful sentences that they have constructed themselves. And this kind of test is very revealing. I think it's uh, very much more difficult to correct this kind of test, and this is uh, one of the things that I very much enjoyed during my year here. I uh, don't have to correct these uh, tests because it's really <laughs> a terrible chore, but it ha it's one that we, uh, while we dislike it, we realize that it's necessary, and we feel it's uh, better to do this than just not to do any real testing of the actual ability of the student at all.
Any other questions? If not, I, I'm, I'll be very glad to answer any more questions afterwards, and you will have a chance to look at these books while you uh, will be enjoying the coffee that uh, Sister Alois is getting ready, I think, uh, to hand out to you. Oh, no, uh, Sister Alois and Sister uh, Agnes Rita. So I uh, think we'll enjoy that together now, and if you have any more questions, I'll be very thankful uh, if you ask them, and I'll try to answer them as well as I can. Thank you very much for the morning.